Welcome, everybody. I am uh, delighted to have today with us uh, Daniel Ravicher. He is the executive chairman of the Public Patent Foundation and a professor at the uh, Benjamin N. Cardozo School of Law. Uh, he's here today to talk about the patent system in the United States, and you've seen a lot of news lately regarding patents, and I am sure we are going to see a lot of discussion about patents in the coming years, and perhaps in the future, people will look at the times of today and think, well, you know, like those were strange laws they had in those times. So please join me in welcoming Daniel B. Ravicher. Thank you, Boris. Uh, I'm so excited to be here again. Uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, I was actually here in 2008, and I gave a tech talk about my organization's mission and activities. So instead of redoing that same talk, we're going to move on to a different topic today, one that I think is one of the most critical features of the patent system is uh, patent quality and ensuring that only meritorious patents uh, get issued. So. With that discussion, I first want to go back and just remind everyone or, or show you for the first time some historical underpinnings for our patent system so we have a frame of reference. Uh, then I'm going to talk about some statistics. There's a lot of good statistics which can help us get a basis for an opinion about today's patent quality. Uh, then we're going to start to think about what is the cause of that state of patent quality, what are the factors that contribute towards it, what are the effects, and finally, what are perhaps some ways to address it. Uh, if you have any uh, bleeding questions while I'm talking, feel free to raise your hand. I'm happy to stop, but otherwise, just take a note and uh, I'll leave, make sure to leave plenty of time at the end for questions and discussion, and I'll make sure that we're all out of here within an hour. Uh, I teach students who are, they like to leave right on the dot, so there's no bleeding, in, uh, bleeding late and other professors are waiting to come in, so we'll make sure we're out of here. So we have to remember that the patent system was very important to our founders. It was a critical component uh, of our new nation. In the enumerated powers given to Congress, it was actually listed above the power to declare war. So this is something that's more important, or at least was higher on the list, uh, than a lot of other things. The key phrase to focus in on here is that the purpose of patents is to promote progress. So anything that does not promote progress is contrary to our founders' intent for the patent system. Now, many of you may have heard that our patent system is about incentivizing innovation. But that does not necessarily promote progress, because progress is innovation plus access. So to give you an example, which I use all the time, let's make patents last five million years. That would increase the incentive to innovate over our current patents, which only last 20 years, because you're getting a much greater reward but it would decrease progress because there'd be no access to that technology for a much longer period of time. So we have to have a balance between incentives and access in our patent system. Uh, Thomas Jefferson was one of the most important people, probably the most important founder uh, when it comes to interpreting our patent system. Uh, and it's important to recognize that even Thomas Jefferson, who was a supporter of the patent system, who did believe it was important to have patents, nonetheless characterize them as an embarrassment. There is something that we as a society shouldn't be proud of, and we shouldn't just willy-nilly grant them, but there are certain limited circumstances where it's justifiable to suffer this embarrassment of granting an exclusive right to someone. And Thomas Jefferson is cited by the Supreme Court repeatedly for his opinions. I won't read the entire quote to you, but the bottom line is the last sentence there which is he insisted upon a high level of patentability. Trivial improvements would not benefit the patent system. If we allowed people to get patents on trivial improvements, that would be detrimental, that would be harmful to our patent system. And again, the Supreme Court just as recently as a few years ago in another case involving what is the standard for inventiveness required to merit a patent or what we call obviousness, uh, again said, we need to make sure patents don't stifle innovation. We need to make sure that they promote progress, and so we can't award patents for insubstantial, incremental, obvious tweaks. So what is the current state of patent quality? I'm gonna ask you a few questions, and we can just have some fun with this. How many patents, the patent office only grants patents once a week, every Tuesday. 
but every Tuesday they issue patents. How many patents do you think are issued by the United States Patent Office every Tuesday? Anybody want to, yes sir, what was your guess? 1,000, 1,000 every week? Because that's 1,000 every, anybody think it's 10,000, well, 10,000. Anybody want to go higher or lower? 500. 500, okay, the answer is about 4,500 patents. That means there are 4,500 things every Tuesday that your federal government tells you you are no longer allowed to do. Okay, I'm a conservative. Okay, it might be different than most of you. I don't trust our government. I think it needs to be checked. And so when there's a bureaucrat in Washington, D.C. telling me there's 4,500 things I can't do every Tuesday, I don't like that. Okay, just as an initial matter. There might be some of those that are worth the embarrassment, to use Thomas Jefferson's phrase, but 4,500 things every Tuesday that I'm no longer allowed to do at least causes me to want to investigate a little further. Okay, well, maybe they do a really good job at the patent office. Maybe they work really hard. <laughs> that is not me laughing for the audience who can't see. Uh, maybe they do a really good job in scrutinizing all 4,500 applications to make sure that they deserve to get How much time do you think should be spent, not just reviewing the initial application, but doing a search for prior art, writing up any issues you have with it, reading any responses you get, debating these issues with the applicant, how much total time do you think should be spent on an application to make sure it's been thoroughly reviewed for accuracy? How much time would you want to spend? How many? 100 hours. Okay, so that's about two weeks, two and a half weeks. Uh, well, our patent office spends 19 hours. That's how much time they spend from soup to nuts to review a patent application, okay? That's very small amount of time. What can you do in 19 hours? I can't do much in 19 hours, including making sure that this exclusive right I'm going to grant is justified. Yes, sir. It fluctuates. It's uh, because there's a lot of turnover. The question is the number of examiners hired, uh, employed by the patent office, but it's in the thousands. Yes, sir. So the question is, what's the credentials of an examiner? It's usually someone with a technical degree in whatever art unit they're hiring for, but not necessarily anyone with a legal background. Okay. So let's look at another factor in the patent system. Let's talk about the fees that the patent office charge. Yes, one more question. You mentioned 4,500 are granted each week. How many are turned down each week? We're going to get to those stats. Okay. Uh, so let's talk about fees for a second, because I think this plays a large role in our patent quality uh, uh, issue. So to apply for a patent, you have to pay the patent office a certain amount of fees, and it's about $1,200. That's how much it costs to apply for a patent. Now, if you go through this 19 hours back and forth with the examiner, and the examiner agrees to allow your patent application to issue, before you can get your patent actually issued, you have to pay a specific fee just called an issuance fee. Now notice the patent office doesn't do anything to earn this fee. It's merely, I'm willing to grant you this patent, but now you have to pay me this bonus payment in order for me to issue it. I'm not gonna do anything, any additional analysis. Well that issue fee is $1,700. Now once I've issued you your patent, it can last for up to 20 years from initial application. But every four years, you have to pay me, the patent office, a maintenance fee. Again, I don't do anything. It's just if you don't pay me this fee, your patent term ends. So at four years, eight years, and 12 years, you have to pay me a total of almost $9,000. So let's look at this. I'm the patent office, right? If I want to reject an application, how much total fees do I derive? 1250, that's it. Because I'm not gonna get an issue fee, I'm not gonna get any maintenance fees because I've rejected your application. Okay, now let's say instead, I decide to allow your patent. Now how much money am I gonna make? An order of magnitude more. For not doing any more work, I'm gonna make 10 times as much money if I grant a patent as if I deny it. Now so many people say, well the patent office isn't a profit making business you know, it's not like they have shareholders and, you know, so to imply that they have a financial incentive to grant patents is improper. Well, I'd concede that they're not 
profit taking. But the patent office does like more fees because the more fees they have, the more people they can hire, the more power they have. Congress actually likes to siphon a significant portion of excess fee payments off to pay for other public programs. So I believe there is financial incentive due to the fee structure to grant patents as opposed to deny them, which has nothing to do with the merits of the application. Yes, sir, in the back. You're going to have to speak up just because I can't hear you. Would this not act as a disincentive for people to have five trivial patents? I'm sorry, I still can't hear you. Would this not be a disincentive for people to do this, uh, trivial patents? Because it, in, they have to invest so much money to, to hold right. on to a trivial right. patent. Right, so the question is, well, isn't the increased fee a disincentive to actually receive a patent? Well, and in some cases, people, even though they've been told they can receive one, they don't pay these fees. And so actually, the number of patents that don't survive past 4, 8, and 12 years is about 20% at each phase, which shows that even to the patent holder, it's not worth paying that amount of money to maintain the patent into the future. But the vast majority of patent applicants do understand that these will be the expectations for them to pay in advance. And so they've already made that decision by filing the application that they're committed and willing to pay the issue fee and the maintenance fees because they want that patent bad enough. So let's talk at the examiner level. How much effort does an examiner have to put in to grant versus deny a patent? Well, if they want to grant a patent to someone. You've applied for a patent. I want to grant it to you. How hard is that for me to do? I'm making you happy. I'm giving you what you want. You're not going to fight that. You're not going to object to it. You're not going to appeal my decision because I'm giving you the patent you want. That's very easy. And examiners get their productivity measured on a quota, basically a quota system. How many patent applications do they close, quote unquote? How many do they resolve finally? Okay, now that sounds on its face to be neutral between grant or deny an application, but let's actually think about that. If they grant a patent, you know, someone applies for a patent, they go, you know what? Approved. They get credit for closing that patent. Now, if they want to reject an application, they have to explain their rejection. They have to deal with the patent applicant's attorneys writing letters back to them, telling them why they're stupid and wrong. Then they have to write back, and then the applicant can appeal that decision, and then the examiner has to write an appeal brief, and time is tick, 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 tick. And so it's much harder for them to get the same amount of credit for closing an application if they want to reject it as opposed to simply allowing it. And a lot of examiners just throw out their hands and say, you know what, this is the system I'm in. I'm getting counted on a quota system. I'm just going to approve it. What do I care? Right? That's how they get their credit for how much work they've done, for promotions, for vacations, et cetera. Yes, sir? How do you know that to be the case, that the examiners are just trying It's very own? public knowledge that they're on a quota system. They're actually all unionized, and there's highly detailed debates between the union and management, and the quota system has been severely criticized both in the literature and politics, and hasn't really been changed. Okay, so let's talk about those patents that get issued, how many of them actually end up being litigated in court? So there's about 225, 250,000 patents granted every year. How many end up in court? Anybody want to hazard a guess? Half of them, a quarter? It's about 1% to 2%. So a very, very small number. Uh, patents actually get litigated. And there's been some academic literature that says, well, those are the ones that are considered to be the most valuable by the patent applicants or the patent holders because they think that's where it's worth to them the burden and expense to actually go to court. Okay? How many of those that go to court actually end up going to a verdict? A lot of lawsuits get filed. They don't actually go to a verdict because they get settled or dismissed or something else happens in the interim. Well, only about 10% of the patents that go to court actually get to a verdict. Okay? So here's a good question. Once patents are being uh, litigated, frequently but not always, so I just want to make sure we're very precise about the language. I don't want to mislead you with these statistics. Frequently but not always, the validity of the patent is challenged. Sometimes the defendant will only challenge the allegation of infringement. They'll concede the patent is valid, but they'll say it's very narrow, and so we don't do what it does, and so we don't infringe. The vast majority of the time, the defendant will make a validity challenge. How often, when a validity challenge is made to a litigated patent, is it proven that the thing described in the patent had precisely, exactly been done before, was already in the prior art? What percentage of the time do you think that happens? 15%? 
So it's, oh, 50%. Sorry? 70. 70%. Okay, well, it's not that often. <laughs> it's 30%, which is still a big deal to me. 30% of the valuable patents, 30% of the 1% most valuable patents that get litigated are proven to have been granted on something that was already done. It was already in the prior art. Now, we also have an additional requirement for patentability, which isn't just anticipation, but even if it hadn't been identically done, was there nonetheless insignificant improvement over what had been done that's manifest in the patent? Is it just obvious, the improvement that you patented here? And that, 40% of the time, patents are found invalid as being merely obvious improvements on what had already been done. Yes, sir? Uh, well, it's interesting because you have to, the, so the question was, isn't it, shouldn't we expect that patents which are litigated are more likely to be invalid? Uh, it depends on too many moving issues, right? How much of a licensing fee are you demanding, right? If you're requiring a very significant licensing fee, say you're requiring a $100 million licensing fee, it only costs me $5 million in litigation costs to challenge your patent. What's the rational actor's probability of success necessary to make that a wise challenge? One out of 20, right? So long as I have a one out of 20 chance of winning zero in verdict, as opposed to $100 million I have to pay you, I'm willing to take that 5% risk. And then I always know that licensing option is probably still gonna be available even if I lose, and numbers may go up some that I've lost, but it won't change that much. So there's a lot of analysis needs to be done about the expectations of the parties, and it depends on different parties. Some parties do very much litigate, but never take the trial patents that they know have severe questions because they don't want to get to a verdict. So they're willing to settle for amounts that are much lower than the cost of litigation. So instead of $100 million versus a $5 million litigation, I'm willing to settle for $500,000. Well, even if you know you have a 50% chance of proving the patent invalid, would you spend $5 million to litigate when the patentee is offering you a license for $500,000? No, because it's, it's worth it to just pay $500,000. So it depends on the numbers. My concern is, even when we take all those factors aside, if we were to say, pull out all the dollar bills in your wallet, and 40% of them are counterfeit. Okay, 40% of them, if you were to go to the bank, the bank would say, actually, this isn't a valid currency. That's a severe concern to me. Okay, so then there's some other statistics. There's a process at the patent office called re-examination. So the initial applying for a patent is called examination. And then there's a process called re-examination, where I can ask the patent to take a second look at a patent it already granted. Now, in order for the patent office to do that, and any member of the public can request this re-examination, the patent office must believe that there is a substantial question regarding the validity of that patent. So before the patent office will even grant a re-examination process, they have to believe there's a substantial question regarding the validity of the patent you're challenging. How often does the patent office itself concede there's a substantial question regarding the validity of patents that it has been asked to re-examine? 92% of the time. 92% of the time when you ask the patent office to re-examine a patent that they previously approved, they previously put their seal on, that they previously signed is okay, they will concede, yep, has substantial questions of patentability. We agree. All right, you had a question, sir. Is that 40%? Did that apply to the 1% or 2% uh, of most value, or is that above all patents? So the 40%, 30%, those are only the ones that actually go to trial that we have a verdict decision on. Okay. So it's not even the 1% to 2 that go to court. It's even less than that. I'm glad you asked it. Thanks for bringing it up. I wanted to mention that. There is some overlap between these, so this isn't a cumulative. 70% of patents are found invalid, because some patents don't get challenged for lack of novelty, some only get challenged for obviousness, and some get challenged for both. So the general statistics are a third of the time patents are held invalid, a third of the time they're held not infringed, and a third of the time the patent holder wins. So that's generally how it breaks down overall. So of those 92% of the times that the patent office itself agrees that there's substantial questions regarding the validity of the patent, what ends up happening at the end of the re-examination proceeding? How often do they simply, well, there was a question, but we've resolved it and we've confirmed that the patent is valid as issued. How often do they say, nope, the patent 
should be canceled in its entirety. And third, which, how often do they say, well, the patent is invalid as issued, but there's still some smaller version of the patent that would be valid. And so we'll reissue just a narrower version of the patent. Well, there's two types of reexamination. There's a type which only occurs between the patent office and the patent applicant. Even as I, as a third party, request reexamination, it's ex parte. It means once I've called the cops, it's between the cops and the patent holder. I'm not allowed to participate. During that type of process, 11% of the time, the patents are canceled. That means 11% of these 92%, the patent office agrees were completely a mistake to ever have granted and should have never existed in the first place. And 66% of the time, of those 92%, they say, oh yeah, it should be changed. It should not have been granted in its original form. Then Congress created in 1999 an inter partes reexamination, which allows the third party requester to actually continue to participate in the process throughout and actually respond to or rebut any arguments made by the patent holder. Now in inter partes reexamination, we see that actually 44% of the patents are completely canceled, completely withdrawn from existence, never should have been issued in the first place. And another 43% are amended. For those of you just watching on video, it's uh, bring your children to work day here at Google. So uh, that's not people objecting to what I'm saying uh, necessarily. Uh, that's coincidental. It wasn't a typo. So the other percentage, the 23% or whatever, 27%, uh, 23% is the number that were confirmed in their entirety. Okay, so just a couple more statistics you might find interesting. So let's compare how we are in here in the United States to other jurisdictions throughout the world. Maybe we're better, right? The world's all relative, right? Maybe we do a better job than the rest of the world. Let's, let's look into that. Okay, patents granted by the, this is the question asked earlier, how many patents does the patent office reject as opposed to allow? There's some, you know, liar, uh, liar's figure and figure's lie. You guys ever heard that? My mom was an accountant. That was one of her favorites. So there's always some debate over any statistics. But I've taken the most conservative number I can find. There's some statistics that actually say it's 90, 90 plus percent of all applications mature into an issued patent. Okay, but there's another study that seems to be pretty uncontestable. It says 78 percent of the time, if you apply for a patent, you're going to get it. Now, what's that rate in Europe? 55 percent. What's that rate in Japan? 61 percent. So you can see there's a noticeably tougher standard applied by these foreign jurisdictions. Now let's compare, so that, but that may not say, well, they're applying for different kinds of patents. Maybe they're applying for harder patents in Japan and that's why there's less that get issued and you're comparing apples to oranges. Okay, so there was a study done in the mid 2000s that took all the patent applications that had been filed in all three jurisdictions at the same time. So an inventor of X applied for a patent in the United States, the European Patent Office and the Japanese Patent Office. Same invention, okay? Of all those that ended up being issued by the Patent Office here in the United States, the similar application was granted by the European Patent Office only 72% of the time. And the same application in the Japanese Patent Office only 44% of the time, okay? And in both the EPO and the Japanese Patent Office only 37% of the time. So relatively speaking, we are a much easier patent office to get a patent from than any other patent office in the world. We are the easiest patent office to get patents from. So in summary, this is my equation. The patent office is a rubber stamp, okay? And what's the theory behind this? Okay, whenever I think about this problem, it makes me, how many people have watched Oprah's favorite things or at least know Oprah Winfrey? You at least know Oprah Winfrey. Okay, so she has this episode, or she used to, every, like, right around the first week of December, called her favorite things. And this is where she would bring onto the show and she'd, you know, shill for all these products, like the Blackberry and all these other things. Half of them might be good, half of them were junk, okay? But she was getting paid tons and tons of money to give these products away to her audience because she got that advertising revenue, she gave them credibility, her stamp of approval, her approval of that product gave it legitimacy, okay? And so she'd go around and people were so happy to be on this show because they knew they were gonna get all this free stuff. Have you not seen these before? They did a whole Saturday Night Live, right? And so this is what I think about the patent office. 
Because pharmaceutical companies, you get a patent. Biotechnology industry, you get a patent. Any patent troll, you get a patent. This is our patent office. Everybody gets a patent. You get a patent, you get a patent, you get a patent, you get a patent, you get a patent. Everybody gets a patent, and the world's better off, right? So what causes poor patent quality? Well, we have to look at incentives. Who all has an incentive to make patent quality worse? First of all, patent applicants, right? If, you look at, if you're applying for patents, you want to get as many patents as possible. You don't care if some of them are bad and some of them are strong. You want as many, as many as possible because they're almost like lottery tickets, right? Some of them are going to scratch off and be duds, whatever. You don't pay the maintenance fees, you let them expire. But others might be winners and you just want as many patents as possible. I teach my students, okay, listen carefully what I say. I tell my students, if you do not get at least some invalid patents for your clients, you have committed malpractice. Let me say it again. If you do not get at least some invalid patents for your clients, you have committed malpractice. Now, why would I tell my students that? Because if you don't get at least some invalid patents, you're not being aggressive enough. You're not being greedy enough. You're not pursuing as much as you can. It's like if you go to buy a house and you make an offer and it's accepted on the first offer. You offered too much. You never want your first offer accepted. You always want your first offer rejected, right? So in the same theory, a patent attorney always wants to get as many patents as possible and a patent attorney doesn't care if they're invalid. Now some people say, oh, but Dan, it doesn't do my client any good to get bogus patents. Not true at all. Because venture capitalists care about how many patents you have. You want to do cross-licensing with other large firms. It counts. A patent's a patent, right? So if I've got 50 patents as opposed to 500 patents, even if those additional 450 are all bogus, I feel better and I get more respect and I can negotiate more with 500 than I can with 50. So patent app attorneys and applicants have an incentive to get more patents of any quality. Patent office, we already talked about their fees, how they get 10 times as much money by granting a patent as by rejecting it. We also talked about examiners and their incentives, how it's easier to award a patent than it is to fight one. Now I know many examiners who care a lot about defending patent quality and they work very hard to reject applications and they're proud of that. So this is no way a personal attack on the examiners. I even know several of the people in management at the patent office. It's not a personal attack on them. It's the system that's been created that they have to exist within. It's a system that's been created that they try to survive in and get promoted in that creates these incentives that have nothing to do with scientific merit whatsoever. We even look at our politicians. They only care about serving the special interest. The third largest special interest behind the Chamber of Commerce and big oil is the pharmaceutical industry. And one of their most important issues is being able to get strong patents on their drugs to keep generics off the market. And so they've created this system so that they can get patents, and it's brought into the system a lot of patents that you guys actually care about. There was an interesting case involving a software patent, or a patent related to software. And it went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And Eli Lilly, how many people have heard of Eli Lilly? It's a pharmaceutical company. Eli Lilly submitted a brief to the Supreme Court in a case involving software patents, which is strange on the first part and you will be flabbergasted to hear what Eli Lilly argued. Eli Lilly argued that software should not be patentable. Now why would a pharmaceutical company A, get involved with a software patent case and then B, argue software should not be patent eligible subject matter? Why would they do that? Because they know they've expanded the patent system so large that it's had all these unintended negative consequences in your industry and they want to take the heat off by just getting rid of them and saying, don't drag down the whole patent system because you're granting bad patents on the internet because that dragging down the whole bad system will hurt our pharmaceutical patents. So it was, I had actually submitted a brief that said almost the same thing and I got bad chills down my spine when I realized that Eli Lilly and I were arguing the same thing. <laughs> Never in my life. Um, now the Court of Appeals, we have a specialized Court of Appeals just for patent cases created in the early 1980s because patent holders felt they weren't getting a fair day in court. So they literally went to Congress and lobbied for a specialized Court of Appeals. And there's been lots of academic literature about how a specialized court will always make decisions to enlarge its jurisdiction. Right? That court, when asked, should we make patents bigger and more important and should we have more jurisdiction, more cases? Yes, yes, yes. 
because they're a specialized court and their desire is to be more important. And so we have this specialized court of appeals. All of these actors don't care about the negative effects whatsoever of bad patent quality. Now, competitors. Some of you might think, well, Dan, you know, if I'm a brand name drug company and there's a generic out there, that generic's going to challenge the quality of my patents and so the public can just free ride on that generic's effort. You would be sadly mistaken. A generic drug company's incentive or desire is to actually somehow get a most favored nation status under the patent. If the generic proves the patent's invalid, that's a decision that can benefit all other generics. Right? So it's not going to benefit much because there's going to be other people who free ride on that effort and enter the market as well. The generic is better off either negotiating a favorable license from the patentee and then they work together to use the patent to keep all other competitors off the market or at least get some kind of non-infringement decision that maintains the validity of the patent to be used against other later generics. Because the first generic wants to be in a duopoly, they don't want to be in a fully competitive market because they make more profit from a duopoly than they would from a market where marginal costs is where the prices tend. Does everyone get that? So let me ask you a question and bring it to your industry. Let's say there was a patent that all of us in this room knew was invalid and we knew we could prove it. And that patent was being asserted against smartphones. It was being asserted against Android. It was being asserted against iPhones. Okay? What would be your incentive if you're Google? Would you rather prove that that patent's invalid and that way it can't be asserted against you or Apple? Or would you rather try to negotiate some kind of relationship with the patentee that maintains the patent's validity to be asserted against Apple, but yet you get a better deal? So a lot of, right? So there's, it's an interesting question, right? The purists might say, if it's a bogus patent, let's prove it's bogus, and the fact that Apple gets the benefit from our cost and time and risk in doing that, whatever. And other people would say, wait a minute, if I can get a license from the patent holder that says I only pay a nickel for every Android phone and they swear they'll never license it to Apple for less than a dime, then I'll take that because now I know Apple's going to have to increase the price of all of its iPhones by 10 cents. I'm only going to have to increase the price of my Android phones by a nickel. Right? So commercial competitors actually do not often have an incentive to challenge the validity of patents. They have an incentive to actually try to manipulate the existence of that patent to create a more preferential treatment vis-a-vis -vis all other competitors in the marketplace. And then there's the savvy actor. Some of you may use the term or have heard the term patent troll. I don't like that term. I think it's pejorative. But there are people who will do this analysis that says if it costs five million dollars for Google to defend itself, I'll send Google a letter or maybe even file a lawsuit against Google which only cost me three hundred fifty dollars or three hundred fifty dollars and forty two cents to send a stamp letter these days. <laughs> And I'll offer Google a license for $50,000. Google might very well pay me $50,000 rather than spend all the money to litigate and prove my patent's invalid. And, and I could totally know my patent has a 99% chance of being proven invalid. But I won't ever get there because no one's going to have the financial incentive to go through that process. So is there anyone who has an incentive to help rid the world of undeserved patents? Well, I would say the public and people who stand up on the public's behalf, this includes consumers, uh, organizations and attorneys like myself and my clients, um, tra uh, and then there's you guys. I think most of you are non-lawyers, most of you are actually people who do stuff to make the world a better place, not you know, fight with each other and are just basically social waste transaction costs. Right? So here we've got, no disrespect to me or my students, it's friction, you're not going to get rid of us. Okay? Just accept it, right? And include it in your calculations, right? So the people who actually do stuff don't want bad patents around. And the people who care about access to markets don't want bad patents around. But other than that, who do you think wins in this fight? It's a tough fight. And the resources are not on the side of those who want to stand for Thomas Jefferson's principle of ensuring that the embarrassment of exclusive rights is reserved only for those inventions that deserve it. But some people, uh, Mark Lemley is a law professor over here at Stanford. He's very well respected. He's a friend. He's a great guy. Uh, but he actually argues this is good. This is a good thing that we have an ignorant patent office. And ignorance is his word, not mine. It's a good thing because the cost of increasing the number of hours each examiner and hiring more examiners and paying them more and giving them more time to do it would be so overwhelming because there's such a small percentage of patents that actually get litigated. It's a good thing, right? This is what I call the Bob Marley, which is don't worry, 
it'll be okay, right? No big deal. What happened to Bob Marley? Okay, so let's look at the negative effects of poor patent quality. So we've already talked about this. Markets get completely perverted. Why is someone allowed to charge a super competitive price by excluding competitors based on a patent they should have never been granted in the first place? It is just completely contrary to any economic theory, any political theory. It is just ridiculous. And yet I can't even get people who are in patent representatives to agree with me. Like I, I love asking this question whenever I'm on a debate or a panel. Is there a single patent issued by the patent office that should not have been granted? They can't answer that because they can't say no because then I can go pull out about 5,000 cases where patents granted by patent office are proven invalid. And they can't say yes because they concede my point, right? There are patents every Tuesday issued by the patent office that should never have been granted in the first place. And this has a negative effect on markets, consumer access. It diverts resources. There's a book uh, by Besson and Muir called Patent Failure, all about the empirical data which shows that applying a patent system to almost all industries causes a net drag on research and development because it siphons away resources from funding you guys and hiring more people like you to go to people like me and my students. I'm fine with that, but it may not be good for society, right? There is one interesting economic study that's tried to put a price like just on the negative effect it has on other innovators. So the fact that Apple has a bunch of bogus patents and you guys have a bunch of bogus patents and you're threatening each other, that drag on research, $21 billion. And you put on top of that all the wasted litigation costs, and so $30 billion a year because of all this waste. That's not trivial. I'm not Bob Marley about that. That's a lot of money. I think this Buffett rule tax that was being proposed would come in at about the same difference to the bottom line. So if we just fixed patent quality, we'd save a lot, the same amount of money as the Buffett rule would, which to me seems pretty important. And then there's a concern that I have that not many economists yet recognize is that this impact on civil liberties. Because technology is such an important part of everything we do, the ability for some company to restrain access to technology can impact our ability to do anything, including speech, assemble, all of our other civil liberties. And we don't have any fair use right in patent law like there is in copyright law. So what can we do about poor patent quality? Let me just do a time check. Okay. Well, on the specific patent level, there's lots of things we can do. One is file these, these administrative challenges I told you about, the ex parte reexamination, the inter partes reexamination. So here's an example of one we filed back in 2004 against a patent held by Microsoft over their FAT file system. And uh, we, at the time, uh, were a very small nonprofit. I was the only employee of the nonprofit. And on that resource, was able to get a patent held by one of the largest companies in the world significantly narrowed. And this is the patent that they were touting to the world that they wanted licensing on. When Microsoft started their licensing program back in the early 2000s, this was one of their, this is the patent we're going to license. And I said, oh, really? Look at all these questions. And the patent office ended up narrowing it. That was one of those vast majority, because that was through the ex parte process. We disagree with that, even that allowance of the narrowed patent, but we had no right to appeal it or pursue it further. Here's another one of my favorite examples. So this is a company called Forgent Networks. Before it was called Forgent, it was called Compression Labs, and it's since been renamed Assure. They had a patent that they said covered JPEGs. Yes, the photo image format JPEG. Okay, and so they started asserting it against everyone. So we filed a re-examination request because we found prior art uh, that we thought rendered it invalid and it should never have been granted in the first place. So I want you to look at the date that the patent office granted our re-examination request. We were one of the 92% that they granted and said, yes, you've raised a substantial question. February 2nd. Okay, now let's look at the stock price. If you look at February 2nd, 2006, it's right about here at its peak. See that drop? That was a 30% drop in the stock price over the course of two days. You can go look at the historical price data between February 1st and February 4th. At the time, the company was originally an $80 million company. It lost 30 to $35 million of market cap, simply because we announced to the world that the patent office had granted our request to re-examine their patent. And if you look, it's never recovered. It had a bit of a dip here, but you just ignore that. You can tell it's trending down to nothing. So for those of you who use the word patent troll, you'd be correct to apply it to this company. 
Uh, and by us filing a reexamination request, which costs about $2,500 to file and maybe 100 hours of my time uh, and a little bit of help from some others, we got it filed. So in exchange for even say we spent $10,000 of the public's money to file that reexamination request, we helped eradicate $35 million of market cap from a company that was based on a bogus patent. And in fact, I got some fan mail. Now my favorite part, I hope there's no kids watching. Okay, good. <laughs> my favorite part is that he wouldn't write out the word A underscore underscore. <laughs> But he had no problem writing out the word B earlier in that sentence. So this is just, you can't even believe the kind of stuff I get. I've been yelled at at conferences. I've been told I should be disbarred. That one of my students tried to get a job at a law firm in DC. They rejected his application when he was interviewing because they said, oh, you work for a bunch of communists. I said, if you want to label me something, that's fine. I like being called names. But communists, when I'm actually trying to prevent the government from taking away my freedom, you're going to have to defend that label. Uh, and eventually in November, the company abandoned all assertion of the patent. So that's what $10,000 can do for the public. So then there's also preemptive litigation, and I'm going to come back to this in a minute, where you can actually file it. If someone's asserting a patent and you're afraid that it may get asserted against you, you're allowed to go to court first preemptively and sue them simply for ruling that their patent is bogus and should have never been granted. Okay, and I'm going to come back to an example. Uh, but then there's just simply exposing it. Expose the hypocrisy. Hi expose the invalidity. So what's an example of that? So back in the day, W3C, I th I'm sure most of you have heard of that. It's an, it's an internet standards body. Somebody laughed when I said I'm sure you guys have heard of it. Yeah. Um, so there is this patent holder named Intermind uh, who assert was asserting this patent over uh, communications over the internet. So communicating over the internet was patented by Intermind. Uh, and they, <laughs> um, you know, it is what it is. So they started asserting this patent against the P3P. How many people have heard of P3P? Uh, it's a protocol. So it just assume any standard. So you've got patent holder asserting patent against standard. So in response, P3P, uh, I mean W3C went out and they got a law firm called Penny and Edmonds, which you can see the author's field there. It says Penny and Edmonds. That was a very prestigious law firm. It doesn't exist anymore, but it, believe me, back at this time, it was one of the best patent law firms in the world. Uh, and they asked Penny Emmons, what's your opinion about this patent? And you can find this on the web still. And basically, this is a copy of the opinion written by those patent attorneys. Now look, they didn't file anything in the patent office. They didn't file a lawsuit. They merely wrote a letter saying, hey, we've looked at this patent, and, and we don't think you need to be worried about it. We don't think you infringe it. We think it's, it's, it's the only way it could be valid is if it's so narrow you don't practice it. Well, what benefit does that do? A, it helps expose the weaknesses of the patentee's case. B, we have uh, in the patent law a certain amount of money that you can be awarded once you've proven that your patent's been infringed, which is a reasonable royalty or your lost profits. Now, when you're simply a company that asserts patents, you don't have any profits lost. You're not like a brand name pharmaceutical company who's lost sales of drugs when a generic enters the market. So all you can really get is a reasonable royalty. Well, the footnote to that is if you can prove that the infringement was willful, you can get three times as much money and your attorney's fees. So you can go from basically a quarter for a reasonable royalty to a dollar, right? So the ability to get willfulness is really a multiplier effect. And that's what patent holders really want to be able to do. Well, your get out of jail free card for willfulness is that you consulted a lawyer and the lawyer told you you don't have anything to worry about. Not even that. You don't have to have consulted a lawyer yourself. If you read another lawyer's opinion that you had no relationship with, about that patent and why your implementation of some technology doesn't infringe it, you can rely on that opinion to defend yourself from any claim of willfulness. So you've basically, I don't like using this, but you've cut this patent off at the knees. You've reduced its ability to scare you. And you've reduced the monetary value that the patent holder sees in being able to sue you. And all this takes is the time to write the letter. And the letter is just something that attorneys, we as patent attorneys do all the time. That's another example. So a more recent example is this patent holder called Arrival Star which you may or may not have heard, is asserting a patent on telling people when a vehicle will arrive. Okay, so they've gone around suing all the public transportation agencies you can think of. The New York City subway, Portland, Chicago, Boston, etc. Okay, well, I actually came to represent one of these transportation agencies. I'm not going to tell you who, but one of them. 
Uh, and the first thing I say is, well, you don't have the right to sue us because the 11th Amendment prohibits states from being sued for patent infringement. Uh, you, you may not know all this history, but the 11th Amendment was basically the federal courts can't hail into their jurisdiction state entities. It was kind of like this separation of powers compromise uh, that our framers made. So after I got called by the third or fourth transportation agency about this, and because they don't have patent attorneys, they're not say none of you knew about the 11th Amendment and patent infringement, right? So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to write a blog post. And so it took me like a day, and I wrote this blog post, and now everyone knows including this patent holder, that they can't sue state transportation agencies, right? And so that's really undercut the threat that they can wield against people, simply by putting up a blog post. So that's what I mean by publicized legal advice. A very low cost, uh, but very harmful to the bogus patent holder uh, activity. On a macro level, administrative changes, we talked about changing the quota system, changing the free structure, all these things, uh, you know, to me, being one who doesn't trust government, doesn't like government, it feels like butting my head against the wall. So I, I don't choose to spend my time much on trying to do that. We do submit comments to the patent office frequently. I know that my name has been submitted to be part of it. The, they have a, an advisory committee at the patent office for the public, a public patent advisory committee. Public patent advisory committee, public patent foundation, sounds kind of similar. I know my name has been proposed several times. They won't even consider me because they don't even want to hear dissent. They don't even want to hear criticism. If you were to ask the, the director of the patent office, uh, he'd say, there's no patent quality problem. What are you talking about? We, we issue only valid patents. And so we're back to that ridiculous question. Well, how many patents a week do you issue are bogus? He can't answer because he knows if he says zero, he'll be laughed at. And he can't admit that his patent office, his signature goes on the bogus patents every week. Legislative change, you know, here's one person's opinion about Congress. <laughs> So what about litigation? I said I'd come back to litigation. Now, this isn't an example from a case involving a technology that you directly care about, but there have been patents granted on your genes which give you a predisposition for certain diseases. How many people think that's a good idea? OK. For the people who can't see, there was no hands raised. Uh, so we, in conjunction with the American Civil Liberties Union, filed a lawsuit, one of these preemptive lawsuits I told you about. When you're aware of a bogus patent, you can go to court and file a preemptive lawsuit challenging the validity of those patents. The district court judge agreed with us that they were invalid. We went to the Court of Appeals, which I told you was a specialized Court of Appeals that's very pro-patent. So they reversed on half of the decision. They upheld half the decision in our favor, reversed on the other half. We then petitioned to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court vacated that decision last month and remanded it to them for reconsideration in light of another patent case the Supreme Court had earlier decided in the month relating to medical diagnostics patents, where they ruled nine to zero that a patent the Court of Appeals had said was okay was not. Okay, so this to me is a clear indication, again, that the Court of Appeals has sided too far in favor of patent holders. And so when we go back, yes, I'm gonna be very confident that we're either gonna get the verdict we want or we're gonna go back to the Supreme Court and they'll reverse Court of Appeals again. But this is an example of public interest litigation in the patent system that you can undertake. Finally, public transparency. Now here's an idea about something Hopefully, maybe one of you finds interesting, maybe not, maybe it's stupid, feel free to tell me about it. This is something that I thought, I'm going to the world's best company for searching and relating documents to one another. And this is something that I have done since day one of being a patent attorney about how to find other references, and it's called patent mapping. Anyone ever heard of patent mapping? Okay, so here, let's assume we have a patent, one, two, three. And on the cover of the patent, or if you even go to Google Patents, you can look and you can see what prior art references were cited either by the applicant or the examiner during the prosecution or the application process. So what was the prior art? Okay, and so here I've represented that as cited reference A, cited reference B, and then I've drawn a circle around that to mean that's what the patent office examiner had before her when she was deciding that application. Okay, so that's, that's the nucleus of your map. Well, then you go and look yourself or you use some very smart people at a big company with lots of servers, something that I am not, and you go find what documents do A and B refer to, okay? So A and B refer to this unsighted document A1 and this unsighted document B1, okay? Now another thing you can do, and this is something that patents, Google Patents does, is you can not only see the patents or references that your specific patent cites, but you can also see later arising documents that cite your patent. So this is what I mean by 
citing one and citing two. Okay, so these are things that came after the issuance of your patent, but then nonetheless have now cited it as prior art. Okay, so we can do that with unsighted A1 and unsighted B1, right? And so now I've got this unsighted A11 reference and this unsighted B11 reference. And they both look like maybe they have something to do with patent one, two, three, because there's, re there's a relationship. They're cousins or, you know, second cousins twice removed, whatever you want to call it. Regardless, they weren't before the examiner, okay? And I can tell you, this is how I find most of the prior art that has undermined all the patents I've ever challenged, is doing this mapping. Not by Boolean searching. Boolean searching sometimes helps, but it's usually duplicative of patent mapping. So then we also go citing one. Well, what else does citing one refer to? Citing one refers to unsighted 1A. Well, lo and behold, look, that also refers to unsighted A11. So when I'm looking at this patent map, I'm thinking, without even reading it, Unsighted A11 seems like a pretty strong reference. Lots of people are referring to it. It's got a lot of causal connections. It seems like it might have something to do. And then you can see how big this can, these maps can get very big very quickly. And then you can also do interesting things like, well, how crowded was the prior art? You know, this patent 123 wants to be able to say that they were very innovative and no one had solved the problem they had solved. Well, if you look at all the prior art that existed before it, that tells you, well, there was actually lots of people focused on this same issue, this same problem. Uh, and so you can start to see where this patent stands in comparison to all the others. So this is something I think could help the public a lot. There are some companies that do this now, they charge a very large fee. Uh, I would love if someone would make this available to the public for free. You just go to a patent, you say map this patent, and you click on it, and bam, you get this graphical interface, and it shows you all this data, and then you can start doing comparison data. Well, how many patents were unsighted for this one compared to the average within this classification? And you can just see all the derivatives of how helpful this information could be to people. And then you may not never even need to use this. The fact that it exists will cause a lot of bogus patent holders to think twice because they know they're not going to be able to take advantage of this uh, lack of information that the public has, this lack of transparency. So with that, I'd be delighted to answer any questions or respond to any comments you guys might have. Thanks again for having me here. I really appreciate it. Yes, sir. Okay. Preference for the microphone. Yes, sir. Um, just a, a request to clarify one fine point. Uh, you talked about protecting yourself against treble damages for willful infringement. Uh, is the citation of the legal opinion, uh, does that override any evidence that, for example, you know, discoverable emails and so forth that you knew at the time that you maybe thought you were infringing, but is that still overridden by the legal Right, opinion? no. Um, so the question is, does the existence of the opinion letter from an attorney per se defeat willfulness, or is it merely a factor that can, gets considered amongst discovery of other relevant? And they are allowed to uh, 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 pursue discovery related to that issue. So there's an email that says, oh, hey, there's this opinion letter out there by this attorney saying we don't infringe, but I completely disagree with it because of the, that attorney didn't know what they were talking about. That would be an email you'd have to disclose, and that would then rebut your defense that you relied on the letter. But as long as you can prove you read the letter, you found it competent, and you relied on it, uh, you can use that letter as a defense to the charge of willfulness. Yes, sir. So this might seem like a glib question, but I promise it isn't. Why don't we just scrap the whole thing? I mean, like, what's the benefit that, what's the evidence that the benefit of a, the patent system as a whole outweighs these, you know, fairly tangible costs and restrictions to our freedom? Right, so uh, I'm a, you know, a lot of people have said that, you know, why don't we just do no harm, right? And the Bessem Muir book does a good job of going industry by industry. And there are some industries where the existence of the patent system does promote progress. Mm -hmm. And so we would want that. Uh, and there's other tweaks we can make to the system. Like if we had an exemption for research, if we had, uh, like the rest of the world does, mm -hmm. uh, if we had uh, better standards for patentability, if we ensured that only valid patents were issued, I think there is some value to a properly working patent system. Uh, so I wouldn't uh, myself vote in favor of overturning it. I just think we need to fix it so that it works better. And then we need to make better policy choices about what fields should exist in or not. Can you give like 
your strongest example of an industry that really benefits from, uh, where everybody benefits from patents existing in that industry? Just whatever it is your strongest you know, example where it's most clearly not broken. You know, uh, the Besson Muir book says that pharmaceutical, and does the analysis of the pharmaceutical industry and also the chemical industry, like Dow Chemical and other chemicals, not just chemicals we swallow. Mm -hmm. um, uh, would really be uh, retarded by the removal of patents. Now, what I've said is that our patents, uh, our pharmaceutical industry is also benefited by FDA exclusivity. So when you invent a new drug, you don't just get patents, you also get an exclusive right to market that drug from the FDA. So we could always tweak that market exclusivity to make sure that we compensate for any decrease in patent issues. Um, but at this point, I, I'm so concerned with just making sure that bogus patents get eradicated I haven't stepped forward to saying, well, let's make sure that the patent system is on the right policy tweaks, although we do debate those as well. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. So whenever um, I asked the government or representatives thereof about getting rid of software patents, the answer was, well, the pharmaceutical industry would be against that. You know, they're, they're big fans of the patent system. So now we've got to the point where even the pharmaceutical industry is arguing that we should get rid of software patents. Is there any chance of actually doing that? And if we were to do so, how would that be done? Well, I wouldn't say the entire pharmaceutical industry is against software patents. Eli Lilly was, uh, right. And so they didn't get the Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association, which is the lobbying group. But um, there are members of that group, and see this. There's an interesting case right now that says, is questioning whether or not putting a patent, putting a known method onto the internet is patentable because the patent office has routinely granted patents for doing something that we knew to do before, but just doing it on the internet. Uh, and so there is a case pending before the Supreme Court may address that issue. Unfortunately, the, it's not something we can just snap our fingers and get fixed. And the lobbying powers in Congress do prevent a lot of times merits from being seen, and instead we only get legislation that benefits special interests. So, you know, it's it's a process. It's a slow-moving process, and I think the litigation system is working in that direction. Uh, you know. So the best thing we can do is, on a micro level, continue to challenge those bogus software patents that get brought up most often or asserted most often, while at also at a meta level continuing to have these policy discussions about more comprehensive change. One of the problems with just saying, let's get rid of software patents, is then how do you define a software patent? Because to you, what might be a software patent, to me, might be a system. right? And so I won't even concede it's a software. And so we end up in this debate about labels. And so we end up just having to review the specific claim language itself. That's one of the main arguments for saying let's not have categorical exclusions, because then you just have people arguing over what does it mean to be within or outside of that category. So. Uh, two very quick questions, one quite specific and another perhaps more open-ended. Um, this 20-year uh, validity of patents, um, is that uh, something based on history? And, and is it still as valid, particularly in the software industry? Is it not possible to? Um, earn back the cost of have, uh, doing the research and applying for the patent in a shorter period of time and would that be useful? Uh, and the second one is there's been a lot of s talk recently about defensive patents, so companies that seek patents sim similarly as defen uh, simply as defense against you know people litigating against them for supposed infringement and is there any, do you have any useful comments on that uh, talk? Right. So the first question was about patent term. It has gotten longer and longer over our history. It used to be 17 years from issuance, and then they changed it to 20 years from initial application. And that's not actually always the case, because you can get an extension to your patent if uh, the patent office delayed your application too much, or if the patent relates to some product that some other government entity delayed approving, like the FDA. So pharmaceutical patents often last much longer than 20 years from application because they get this patent term extension. There's even people who go to Congress and try to get a specific bill just to extend their patent. So like that really heavy flashlight, I think it's called a magna light or something like that. Those people try to go to patent office several times to get a specific law passed just to extend the term of their patent. So the term isn't as specific as I said, but it has generally tended over time to lengthen. But people know that that would be a more transparent change to the patent system. It would be more easily opposed. So instead of doing that, they do other things, like enlarging patentable subject matter to include things that people thought were not within the original intent, by including the remedies available to patent holders, by increasing the burden on a challenger to prove a patent invalid. So they do these other things. 
Plus, patentees are savvy enough to be able to file multiple applications on related products so that just as the first patent is expiring, lo and behold, they've got a second patent that has now been issued and that they can extend the coverage of their product for. And this is why a lot of times you'll hear pharmaceutical products will go from the regular pharmaceutical to like the extended release version. Have you ever heard of that? Well, do you know why they're going to the extended release? Because they have a patent on the invention of making the drug in an extended release form and the patent on the original chemical has since expired. And so they went to all these doctor's offices as the first patent was about to expire and said, you better not prescribe the old pill to people because that'll kill people. You better prescribe only the extended release and we're gonna run all these commercials convincing consumers they have to buy the extended release and that the old pill's bad because now it's generic and now we have a patent on the extended release form. So this kind of like uh, evergreening of patents is a, is a very sophisticated but uh, frequently used strategy. Defensive patenting, Again, there's the pragmatic versus the theoretic perspective. The pragmatic perspective say, hey, it's beneficial. It doesn't cost us much. That's why I said in my examples, those parties who are incentivized to get bad patents include commercial entities, commercial competitors, patent applicants, because the more patents you have isn't harmful in any way. Right? There's no net negative to getting a bad patent. You spend a few thousand dollars on it, and that's trivial compared to how beneficial it can be. Um, but theoretical, there can be one of these you know, what would we say to our kid? Well, if the other kid is being bad, then should we be bad? No, we tell our kid, look, you do the right thing because that's the right thing to do. Um, you know, and the defensive patenting doesn't work too much against some of the most frequently litigated patents, which are held by non-practicing entities. So there's no threat of retaliation against them because they don't have a product. Right? A defensive patent doesn't help you against like a, who you would call a patent troll. It doesn't work because the patent, you can't sue the patent troll. Right, the defensive patenting only helps against other large commercial actors and usually just end up cross-licensing. So, It's a strategy that can be helpful, um, but it's unfortunate that it's a strategy people have to waste money on instead of using that money to hire more engineers to make better products and services for the American people. So, Thanks again for having me here so much.